What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to The Cosmic Wonder. I'm your host, Warren Thompson, and She-Hulk Episode 3 is now out. Many people have said it's their favorite episode so far, and it is the first episode where we kind of get a setup for the overall villain of the show, which hasn't really been revealed yet. I do believe that Titania is going to be one of the main villains of the show, however, I do think there is a bigger villain that is behind a lot of things, including the Wrecking Crew, who we did see attack Jennifer Walters in this episode with as Guardian construction gear that they were using as weapons, which of course would have worked on any normal person, but Jen is She-Hulk. Now of course, She-Hulk tears them apart, she literally bashes their heads together, and they pretty quickly realize that it was a bad idea as the leader yells, bad idea, and they all run away. Now these guys seem like some pretty big amateurs and you can tell as they get back to the van, they say boss is gonna be mad. Of course none of these people are in charge, they're just the lackeys. But I know that everybody is dying to know who the boss is. Now I must say that I have seen episodes 1 through 4 and in episode 4 we do not find out who the boss is, so I do not know who the boss actually is. But of course, I have a theory, and I think this is how everything is going to be connected. And I'll start with this because I know a lot of people really wanna know who the boss is. Now, there are several different options of who the boss could actually be. One option could be Titania herself. She's a super influencer. She has superpowers, and basically her powers are strength. They're basically the same powers as She-Hulk, except she doesn't turn into a green monster. But Titania got humiliated by She-Hulk at the end of the first episode. Episode, and you know that Titania is going to have some followers. She's an influencer, a super influencer, so these could be her lackeys, and she could want She-Hulk's blood to make her even more powerful, even more strong, and eventually get back at Jennifer Walters. Now, this is an option because we know that Titania is going to be appearing again in the She-Hulk series. In fact, she's probably going to be in it a lot in future episodes. And this is an option, however, I don't think it is what is actually happening. And let's be honest, no offense to Titania, I think her character's awesome, but we want somebody a little bit bigger to be the boss. Now, there is always the option that the villain Red Hood could be the boss. In the comics, Red Hood actually is in charge of the Wrecking Crew at one point, and we've just recently learned that he is going to be the villain of the Ironheart series coming to Disney+. Plus. We've even seen photos of him. This is a pretty decent connection, so it could be him. However, there is a bigger connection and a bigger villain, who I believe is Kingpin. And to me, this kind of just makes the most sense. We know that Daredevil is going to show up in She-Hulk, but we specifically know that Daredevil, the new Daredevil in his new yellow suit, is going to show up, not Matt Murdock in court. I'm sure we might see Matt Murdock in court, but everything that we've seen so far shows us Daredevil. So why would Daredevil be working with She-Hulk? Well, it's probably because the Wrecking Crew is after She-Hulk and they're going to be coming back. Daredevil probably knows that they work for Kingpin. Think about it, Kingpin was introduced in Hawkeye. We know that he's going to be back in the Echo series, even though it seemed like Echo killed him at the end of Hawkeye, and we know that Daredevil Reborn is probably going to have Kingpin as the main villain as well. We also know that Daredevil will also be in Echo. Now, in the comics, Echo does shoot Kingpin in the face. She actually shoots him in both eyes and he goes blind. However, he doesn't die. He eventually gets his sight back, and perhaps that's what he wants She-Hulk's blood for. Could you imagine a Kingpin who also has has Hulk properties to him, he would be even more strong than he already is. He would almost be unstoppable. And they actually kind of set this up in the first episode. The Hulk tells Jin, now that I've analyzed your blood, he had to get rid of her blood so nobody else could use it. So it never gets into the wrong hands. That was obviously major foreshadowing. I assume that Kingpin probably wants the blood for its healing properties so he can get his eyesight back. But I also think that in turn, this is also going to give him incredible strength, even more than he already has, which is going to set him up to be a big bad of the MCU. But hear me out, he's not going to be a big bad like Kang the Conqueror or Doom, but he's going to be the street level big bad. Kevin Feige has already confirmed that the heroes are basically breaking off into groups, and the three groups that he's basically confirmed already are the street level team, in which he actually mentions Spider-Man and Daredevil together. He mentioned the supernatural side, which of course is going to focus on Moon Knight and Blade and other characters like that, hopefully Ghost Rider, fingers crossed, and of course, the cosmic side. And it makes sense that each kind of group would have their own big bad, and I'm assuming Kingpin is going to be the street level's big bad. Especially since Kevin Feige did say that Spider-Man and Daredevil were going to team up, it would make sense that they would team up against Kingpin. We have yet to see Spider-Man in the MCU go up against Kingpin, and I think that's something that a lot of people would really love to see. 
So there are a ton of connections here leading me to believe that Kingpin is most likely the boss. Of course, I could be wrong, but it does seem like there are a lot of connections here to support this theory. Now, it also does seem like Emil Blonsky, aka The Abomination, is going to be recruited for the Thunderbolts. And of course, another option of who the boss could be is Valentina, who we've seen pop up a couple of times in the MCU already, recruiting for a team. And we know this team to be the Thunderbolts, and perhaps the Wrecking Crew is trying to get She-Hulk's blood for Thunderbolt Ross so he could become Red Hulk. More on this in just a bit, but first, thank you to Best Fiends for sponsoring this video. I think we all know how much pressure life can put on us sometimes, and I know it's really easy to put off having a little bit of relaxation time and a little bit of fun, but that shouldn't be how it is, and with Best Fiends, an exciting puzzle adventure game, you can have fiendish fun anywhere, anytime. Best Fiends is an awesome puzzle game that I truly enjoy because it's not just connecting in straight lines, but you can actually connect diagonally, which is a lot more fun, and you can play it anytime because it's super quick to play, and you level up very, very easily. In fact, the first time I played it for only a few minutes, I got all the way to level 6. That's because this game is really easy to just pick up and get in the zone because it's super fun. One second you're on level 1, and then the next thing you know, you've connected enough times to get to level 6, and there are literally thousands of different levels you can play and the best part is best fiends is free to download so don't put off your fun time anymore you've definitely earned it go to the app store or google play to download best fiends for free plus earn even more with five dollars worth of in-game rewards when you reach level five that's best fiends without the r now, Marvel Studios has already announced the Thunderbolts movie officially this year at SDCC. It has a release date of July 26th of 2024, so it is less than two years away. We've already seen Valentina actually recruit a few people for the Thunderbolts team. One, of course, is US agent John Walker. The other, of course, is Yelena Belova, who we've already actually seen working for Val. If you don't know who the Thunderbolts are, they're basically Marvel's Suicide Squad. They're a team of criminals who are working for the government, doing the more dirty work that the Avengers can't be seen doing, plus they probably wouldn't want to do it anyways. So recruitment for the team has begun, and I'm assuming that Abomination is going to be a part of this team. Jennifer Walters has now gotten Emil Blonsky out on parole, and I'm assuming that Valentina is going to show up on that piece of land where he's going to be going with his seven lovers, and tell him that he basically has to join the Thunderbolts. Now, another part of the Thunderbolts and what could possibly be going on here in this episode and overall is Red Hulk. In the comics, Thunderbolt Ross is Red Hulk. Now recently, very, very tragically and sadly, William Hurt, who played Thunderbolt Ross, has passed away. So this is kind of up in the air right now if they're going to recast for the character, but originally, I think the plan was to have him become Red Hulk in the MCU. So for the sake of this theory, we're just going to act like they are going to recast and that character is still going to be around. He could be the one behind Valentina, because after all, the Thunderbolts team did come from Thunderbolt Ross, and we all know how shady the character is, so it makes sense that Valentina would be working for him. Now, I also think the Wrecking Crew could be working for him as well, because we know that Thunderbolt Ross wants to kind of recreate and perfect the Hulk, essentially making and perfecting a super soldier serum, which we essentially saw in The Incredible Hulk. But, you know, we don't talk about that movie. So now that a new Hulk is around, and this Hulk is seemingly conscious just the entire time not having to fight an alter ego, this would definitely pique the interest of Thunderbolt Ross, so he would definitely want the blood of She-Hulk so he could examine it and try to perfect it. So he could be behind the Wrecking Crew, and maybe he does end up getting her blood, and maybe he uses it on himself, and this is how he could become Red Hulk in the MCU. Now, this episode primarily focuses on two things. One is the trial of Emil Blonsky, aka The Abomination, and the other follows Attorney Pugliese and Attorney Bukowski. Mr. Bukowski is suing Runa, who was an elf from Asgard, who could shapeshift and shapeshifted into Megan the Stallion, and tricked Bukowski, and he thought he was actually dating the real Megan the Stallion. He paid for about $175,000 worth of things for her, including buying her a Passat, which should have been a red flag there, which Jen even points out, that Bukowski is stupid for thinking that Megan the Stallion, the super successful and wealthy woman, drives a $40,000 car. Now, we all know that Jen and Mr. Bukowski used to work together at the DA's office, and they didn't really like each other. Specifically, Jen really does not like Attorney Bukowski. He is a narcissist, and he is very much delusional. And while at the bar with Pugliese, they're all kind of talking crap about him, and Jen talks a lot of things about how delusional he is, and Pugliese asks her if she would be willing to testify under oath, 
in court. Of course, she says yes because it's an opportunity to humiliate him. But with Jen's help, they win the case. And then we see the actual Megan the Stallion who is in the courtroom. She, of course, is there because somebody was impersonating her. This actually sets us up for the post credit scene. No, not the twerking, which is all anybody, of course, is talking about right now. But the fact that Megan the Stallion has now officially hired Jen Walters as her attorney. But of course, the twerking does happen. Of course, they dance to Megan the Stallion songs, in which she says, You are way more fun than my last attorney attorney, Jen says I will kill for you, in which Megan the Stallion says dial it back a bit. Now the other trial, of course, is with Jennifer Walters defending Emil Blonsky. And the episode actually starts off with her being super pissed off at him because she failed to mention that he broke out of prison and was fighting in an underground fighting tournament. This is what we saw in Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. And here's where it gets kind of interesting and could be a hint at the Thunderbolts actually happening. Emil tells Jin that he was forced out of the cell by Wang, and that it was only one time. However, we know from Shang-Chi that Wang and the Abomination have actually practiced several times. Wang even mentioned that they were practicing holding back Abomination's punches so they didn't hurt Wang as much. So this wasn't just a one-time thing here. Wang broke Emil out several times, it looks like. So it looks like Emil was kind of lying a bit. Now, ultimately, Wong does show up to Jennifer's office, and we hear a few jokes and connections to Spider-Man No Way Home. Now, Wong does admit that he did break Emil Blonsky out of prison against his wishes because he required a worthy opponent as part of his training to become Sorcerer Supreme. Now, this makes you kind of question things because we know that Shang-Chi took place after the blip after the five-year gap where everybody came back. But Doctor Strange says that he was not the Sorcerer Supreme because he was blipped for five years and Wong wasn't, implying that Wong became the Sorcerer Supreme during those five years. However, we might have misinterpreted that. Perhaps the five years just gave him the experience that was required to become the Sorcerer Supreme, although that means that during that five-year period, there was no Sorcerer Supreme. This could be a little bit of a hiccup, but it's not that big of a deal. But Wong says, hey, since I'm the Sorcerer Supreme and I broke him out, I demand he not be punished. But of course, Jen is the one defending him, not punishing him, and she says that they're not going to let him out after they see this. Wong then makes a reference towards Spider-Man No Way Home. He says, I know what you're thinking, Miss Walters, and I'm not erasing everyone's memories. Not again, in which Jen says that's highly unethical, and Wong says, yeah, it's also very messy. Believe me. Now, this also kind of seems like a little bit of a hiccup, but I'm sure they'll explain this later on because Wong is not really supposed to know about the whole memory racing event because Peter Parker was supposed to be erased from everybody's memories. And that may be true, but perhaps Wong knows about Spider-Man. It was made clear at the end of No Way Home that people still know who Spider-Man is. Doctor Strange simply made everybody forget who Peter Parker was. So Wong could know that Doctor Strange erased everybody's memory of who Spider-Man actually is, as in the person under the mask, and that doing that actually created a lot of multiversal problems that happened during Spider-Man No Way Home, which Wong kind of, you know, you know, turned his back on. So it's very possible that Wong could have known everything that happened, and the only thing that he simply forgot is who Peter Parker is, who the identity of Spider-Man is. But he could remember everything else because the memory of Spider-Man and the events that took place during Spider-Man No Way Home were not erased. Wong then makes another joke, and I'm glad to see this lighthearted side of him, and he says, okay, fine, we'll send him to the mirror dimension. Jin says no, and he says shadow dimension, in which she says no again, and then he says we'll keep that for plan B in case the trial doesn't work out. Out, but he does agree to show up and testify. Now, ultimately, Emil Blonsky does convince everybody that he truly has changed, and he has a lot of great witnesses that come to the stand on his behalf, and eventually Wong does show up and says, yep, it was me, I broke him out. Emil also demonstrates that he can turn into the abomination anytime he wants and turn back into his normal form. But before the trial ends, they look at Wong and they say, you do know you have committed a crime, right? In which case, he just leaves. He's the Sorcerer Supreme, he doesn't have to answer to anybody. Except maybe like some cosmic entities. Fingers crossed. Now, all throughout this episode, Marvel is pretty clever with using social media and media in general to provide humor, but also reflect how it actually is in the real world. When Jennifer is walking up to the DODC prison facility, one of the reporters asks her about the rumor of her being kicked out of the Avengers in which another reporter hears and instantly reports on that same rumor, stating that Jennifer Walters is rumored to have been kicked out of the Avengers. That often happens a lot in real life. There's also a really cool Easter egg one time when she is walking out when a reporter asks her if this all happened, her turning 
turning into She-Hulk because of a mafia hit gone wrong. This is actually her origin story in the comics. A person named Nicholas Trask had put a hit out on her because she was defending a client that he was at odds with. So some mafia guys showed up and shot her. This is when Bruce Banner took her, gave her a blood transfusion, which is how she became She-Hulk. So this is a cool little Easter egg here on her origin. In the comics, that is. Now we also see a bunch of social media posts and videos as well that I actually find kind of clever because this is kind of Marvel getting on top and ahead of everything with people talking about how too many superheroes are female now and that they need to make a new superhero instead of kind of recreating a male superhero referring to the Hulk. You can even see signs of Team He-Hulk and I think this is pretty clever on Marvel's behalf because they already knew that there were going to be a bunch of people out there who don't like She-Hulk just because it's a woman. They even even have She-Hulk finally go into news to kind of control her own narrative in which the reporter basically asks her kind of dumb questions and then they say when they get back they're going to talk about She-Hulk's diet and this is actually something that kind of happened in real life and Marvel Studios when they would do press conferences or interviews something that would happen in the past is that some reporters would ask the males serious questions but when they got to the females they would ask them what their diet was and what they wear underneath their uniforms so this is kind of a reflection and a pun on that and that's She-Hulk episode 3 let me know what you thought about it in the comments down below and also let me know what you think about my theories about Kingpin possibly being behind the Wrecking Crew. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you're new to the channel. Stay up to date on the MCU. For live updates, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. And as always, thank you all so much for watching. Woof woof.